No. I'm quite sure he said that. No, he, he <laughs> I might have misinterpreted <laughs> oh, really? what he was trying to say. Okay. Hey, if you've got a confession, we can swap it for a smart speaker. If we use your confession, uh, you just get in touch. Confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. Today's comes from Competitive Dad. Oh, Thanks, okay. Competitive Dad. Dear Matt and the other two. Oh! <laughs> Surely not. This Come is a sport-based confession, so oh. I'm asking for Matt's forgiveness particularly, and the fact that he normally forgives everyone. Yep. Also, you read out my wife's confession recently. Hers was the stressed mum confession. Oh. The, what, the coming down the steps? Coming down yeah. the steps with the dress and the wind oh, and all yeah. that kind of stuff. So in true competitive dad fashion, I want a smart <laughs> okay. speaker as well. <laughs> we are lucky to have two children who are wonderfully different. Whilst our younger appeared to be born with a football stuck to his feet, our elder hated sport and, quite honestly, was rubbish at it. Couldn't throw, couldn't catch, couldn't run. This was never a problem, didn't bother him. He had lots of other talents, but over the years, I did give him the chance to try lots of sports with the hope that he may find one that he enjoyed. I tried tr cricket, golf, tennis, amongst others. He showed no interest till one day... I took him to the local squash club. Ah. He wasn't very good, but importantly, he really enjoyed it. And Sunday afternoon squash became our thing. With some various uh, rules over the years, Dad playing left-handed or only scoring on every other point, we could have some competitive matches. As I said, my uh, oldest son had other talents, and we were very proud. Uh, when he went to university, I was even more proud when he said he joined the uni squash club. He's... <coughs> excuse me. He said this was mainly for the social side because they had some drinking game called circling and drunk pints of purple. I found out that purple was snake bite uh, uh, and was actually black, which I had been drinking for 30 years. So that's snake, that's, what is so, that? So that's lager, cider and blackcurrant. Yes. Lethal. Don't, absolutely don't try no. this at home. <laughs> anyway, but typical of the younger generation, invent a new name for it, pretend you were there first yeah, and yeah. purple was their yeah. thing. Anyway, as I said, he joined the squash club and I was, uh, was really enjoying university. And when he returned home for the summer, we resumed our Sunday afternoon squash. I was so pleased to find out that it wasn't just for the social side. He'd actually been playing squash twice a week and had lessons. Mm. And his squash had massively improved. As hard as I tried, I could no longer beat him at squash. Simon, I can honestly say this didn't bother me. <laughs> mm. Really? Honestly? I had just turned 50, and there was no shame in losing to a 19-year-old. True. Okay. However, after one Sunday match, my son innocently said that he, he might have to find someone else to play against when he was back home because he couldn't get a proper workout with me. <laughs> he may have to play his younger brother. Well, that hurt. I have to tell you, all those years playing him with my left hand, and now he wants a new squash partner. I wasn't having any of that. So I put a plan into action. I knew my son would have a big Saturday night out before he returned to university. So I suggested a last game of squash on the Sunday afternoon the next day. I then suggested he had his mates around for pre-drinks or pre's as I believe they're referred to. And I would drop them into town. I smiled as I dropped off four slightly unsteady friends uh, into their town visit. I got home and had an early night and smiled again when I heard him stagger in at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so at 10.40 a.m. Sunday morning, I banged on his bedroom door. Oi, are you ready for squash? It's booked for 11. Oh! <laughs> I, thought you, I, I, thought you, I thought you said it was this afternoon, mumbled the reply. No, all booked up this afternoon. I'm afraid all the courts were gone. Come on, uh, I've done you a water bottle. <laughs> I mean, I've done you as though pouring water into a bottle should entice him out anyway amazingly he got up and we made it to the court by 11 o'clock <laughs> well I won the first game easily as he was still half asleep and whilst he responded by winning the second he was a spent force and had drunk the contents of the water bottle I won the next three games for a convincing 4-1 <laughs> win we visited the bar afterwards and he had to admit that I'd beaten him easily Dad could still give him a run for his money. He had, of course, underestimated me. Well, competitive dad says, Simon, as the saying goes, age, experience and a little treachery will beat youth and enthusiasm every time. And so I must now beg for forgiveness from my son. You see, I may have encouraged him to start drinking early on purpose and there may, after all, have been courts available in the afternoon. 
and I might have just filled the smallest water bottle that I could find, but oh. I did need to do something to level the playing field and beat him just one last time. I think there's a little hint of desperation there in Competitive Dad. He remembers every score, he remembers every game, he remembers every stroke. He finally gets to beat his son uh, at squash. One more time. Uh, Sister Katie Susie. Uh, well, somebody blessed with a dad who is apparently good at absolutely everything. Uh, those wins mean a lot. And if <laughs> yeah. I would not want those taken away from me. Those are some of my proudest moments oh, when you yeah. beat your dad at something. And also, it's a credit to your teaching. You got him into squash, you went away and learned it. You should be really proud rather than sabotaging him. So, competitive dad, a little bit too competitive, I think. You are not forgiven. Uh, brother from another gutter. Well, uh, let's be clear here. Son was the one who was saying, oh, I'm going to have to start playing someone else because you're not very good anymore, even though he's in his 50s and Son is 19, uh, thinking everything's going his way. Just you wait, sunshine. <laughs> um, but, but also, you know, it was a Son's decision to go out that night. No one's forcing you to go out on the ale, sunshine. So for that reason, I choose to forgive. I think you should do a book, Matt's Parenting Guide. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I think it would get, I think it would, I think it would get yeah, snapped up. Anyway, do you forgive competitive dad? That's the question for the people's verdict. Do you forgive him? I guess it will, a lot will depend on your uh, family status. Anyway, 61054. First word is Simon. Uh, tonight's confession came from competitive dad. You've got tonight's smart speaker. Torrid tale of how he sabotaged his own squash game, his, his son's own squash game, just so he could get one over on his teenage son. Uh, this is the this is the son who you remember from last week's confession, who had to hold his mother's dress down whilst going down the steps to keep her dignity intact. When he was four, yes. Yes, 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 when he was four, of course. Uh, OK, but cheating at squash, that's what this boils down yes. to. Here's the people's verdict. It's worth saying just about everyone's forgiving because just about everyone is saying they are competitive dad. Aidan Hull says, Forgiven, always beat the upstarts any way you can. Wise man, Simon in Halewood. I forgive. As a 57-year-old, I know what kids can be like, so anything you can get over on them is a bonus. Uh, and Sean on the sunny Isle of Wight says, Dad is forgiven. I wish I'd thought of his plan. I occasionally used to beat my son on our Friday afternoon matches until he started working and we introduced the loser pays rule. Oh. After that, I never won a single game. It cost me a fortune over the next few years. I'm glad he's at university now so we don't have to play anymore. <laughs> so, uh, OK, so a little bit of forgiveness heading the way of uh, competitive. Dad gets tonight's smart, uh, smart speaker. Uh, maybe you have a family rivalry, a sibling rivalry, a parent-child rivalry, which yeah. makes the basis of a very fine confession for us all. We'd love to uh, see it, and then I can read it out, then you can get a smart speaker. But I think two's enough for this family. <laughs> no more from you. you. Uh, confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. It's confession time. We would love to give you a smart speaker. All you have to do is to send us your top confession. And if we use it, you get a smart speaker. We uh, entered yesterday into the world of competitive confessions. Um, but anyway, I'm not quite sure where this is going to register, whether you're going to forgive Captain Haddock, who sends oh. in uh, today's tale. Father Simon, I was listening to your confessions tonight about the young man called Fly and his mate Spider about the spurious autograph. And oh, it brought yeah. back a memory of a similar, but not really, incident that happened to me. Well, is it similar or not, Captain Haddock? <laughs> Let's find out. In December 1971, I was a newly qualified, straight out of the box, physical training instructor in Her Britannic Majesty's Royal Navy. My first posting was to the Clyde Submarine Base in Faslane, which I joined in January 1972 after Christmas leave. There was a tradition in the Navy that all the hair you could secrete under your cap, you could keep, up to a point. I had successfully grown a nice afro, and it all sat under my cap without causing any problems. This is an interesting detail which will become essential okay. to you understanding the confession later on. Way back then, says Captain Haddock, pubs were not allowed to open on Sunday. Only hotels were allowed to sell alcohol. I'm not sure why, but naval establishments that had bars were also allowed to sell alcohol. Oh. Being up in Faz Lane on a Sunday meant that some of the locals were also allowed onto the base to attend discos and so on. To the age-appropriate young people of the vicinity, it was somewhat of a magnet, and a good time was had by both military and civilian alike. <laughs> you can imagine. Where can we go for a drink? I know. <laughs> Let's go to, Let's the, go to the naval base. <laughs> On one such Sunday lunchtime, the organising committee must have had a sudden rush of blood to the head because they had booked the fabulous Equals 
Still to this day, I have no idea how they pulled that one off. But it was usually a local band or a sailor's band or something. But imagine, we had the equals. Baby Come Back, Viva Bobby Joe, a couple of the hits. Mm. Eddie Grant was the lead singer. It's them. They came on stage and completed a magnificent set. All of their hits up to that moment in time. And then they did a couple of encores and they finally left the stage to rapturous applause. I was sitting near the front of the stage in my civvies talking to some people when a sailor walks over. I knew he was a sailor because of his haircut and I'd seen him around the base a few times. He asked me for my autograph and being in the Navy, I was used to getting sent up. It was virtually a law in the Navy. We took the mickey at every opportunity. So I asked him why. Why, says he, because you're Eddie Grant. He continued <laughs> oh, right. with a genuinely puzzled look on his face. I'm not Eddie Grant, I replied. <laughs> says Captain Eddie, I'm one of the PTIs here on the base, which, if you remember earlier, physical training yeah. instructor. Mm-hmm. For goodness sake, Eddie, says this sailor, only want your autograph, not your firstborn child, he said, and he's starting to get a bit leery. Ah. Seriously, mate, says I, and here I used the naval vernacular for PTI, okay. I am a club swinger here on the base, because that's how we're referred to. Just to try to persuade him that he was wrong, but he wasn't deterred in the least. The other people at the table were most amused and wondered what I was going to do with the drunken sailor. Oh, very good. I had to get that line in, (laughs) says Captain Haddock. He was insistent that I was Eddie Grant and that I was being a bit of a diva for not giving him my (laughs) autograph. Well, finally, Father Simon, I cracked. I thought the best way to handle the situation was to admit that I was indeed Eddie Grant and sign his autograph book for him. After all, I didn't want... To, I didn't want to be insulting dear old Eddie in the future, telling all his mates that Eddie Grant of the Equals was up himself and wouldn't give autographs to a hard-working member of Her Majesty's Armed Forces. Perish the thought! I asked him his name, signed with a flourish I imagined a pop star would employ. Lots of love, best wishes, and so on. Eddie Grant, <laughs> kiss, kiss, kiss. I asked him his name, signed, and it, off it went. Yeah. He went away happy, showing his mates his latest acquisition. Look, Eddie Grant, he signed, look at that. I asked forgiveness clearly, though, from uh, the young man, I was probably actually younger than him, for looking too much like one of his heroes. I didn't have many options that day other... uh, I didn't really have many options that day other than to sign. I asked forgiveness from Eddie Grant for impersonating him, even unintentionally, for he is slash was much better looking than I, (laughs) but I, I couldn't let him get a bad rep, really, on my behalf. By the way, on leaving the disco, one of the regulating staff, the naval policeman, recognised me from the gym and had me report to the regulating office the next morning. Alas, I was marched to the barbers and watched in horror as my newly cultivated afro was transformed in seconds into a regulation short back and sides. Oh, Oh, no. (laughs) And a short top, too. (laughs) I'm sad to say that I never have been mistaken for anyone famous ever again. Fifteen minutes and out, that is what I'm reporting to you. But uh, can I get forgiveness? That's what I'm asking. Captain Haddock uh, signed in the name of Eddie Grant, uh, pop superstar, uh, Sister Katie Susie. Well, Captain Haddock, you did. I'm going to forgive you here because you did try to tell him on numerous occasions that you weren't Eddie Grant, whereas I think my issue with Tom Jones was that you had many opportunities yes. to, to be truthful. He said truthful. I'm the club swinger. Yeah, he tried He used the proper lingo. He tried to, to get out of it. And, you know, he just wanted to protect Eddie's reputation. I think that's very thoughtful of him. Uh, so, yeah, you're forgiven, Captain Haddock brother from another guy. Yeah, I mean, he didn't really have any choice here, did he? Uh, faced with someone who was uh, as clearly so demanding, and and in a way, didn't he just give him hope, Joanna? Yes, he did! <laughs> really? Eddie Grant, mm, that's yes. right. Okay. Uh, uh, inspired, I thought. Uh, yes. So, I am going to forgive. I don't want to dance. <laughs> Electric <laughs> I'm Avenue, gonna some Jackie, I'm going to play some Jackie Wilson anyway. <laughs> Forgiveness, yes or no? Uh, an epic coming up in just a moment, but we have the people's verdict in on Captain Haddock. Uh, his confession earlier about how he was forced into impersonating Eddie Grant. Uh, here it comes. This is what people think. Yeah, everyone's forgiving. Andy from Wallace, he says, forgiveness is granted. Uh, Joanna oh, yes. says, forgiven only because we had the equals back in 1971 at Weatherby Town Hall. What a band. And finally, Helen from Fleet says, forgiven. I bet the drunken sailor went away walking on sunshine. Okay, well, as you yeah. know, full, mark, full marks for trying. Um, if you uh, have a confession, we would love to hear it. Uh, and if we use it, you get a smart speaker. You send it to confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. Quarter to six, confession time. If you have a confession for us, on an email, please, to confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. If we use yours, 
you get a smart speaker. Today's comes from Salty Steve. Thank you, Salty Steve. Uh, I, I should warn you that this uh, this confession um, probably won't be one for my voiceover reel. <laughs> um, <laughs> really? It does absolutely have to contain an accent for which I'm apologising now. <laughs> oh, it's not one of my uh, strengths, yeah. this particular one. Anyway. Okay. Loving it. Anyway, Salty Steve says, Father Simon, the ever-forgiving brother from another gutter and sister Katie Susie, forgive me for today I have sinned. So I think this might have happened, like, now. Oh, really? For reasons I couldn't find out, all the power has gone off where I live. Eventually I found out that it's going to be off for some time. This is incredibly annoying, obviously, as fridges and freezers will switch off and food will rot. The TV won't work, but mainly the power cut means no hot water. I hate the very thought. Uh, wishing to be presentable this particular evening for a fabulous date and hating cold showers and only slightly less than cold shaves, I decided to head for my local swimming pool and use their facilities. Then, after a short and refreshing swim, I could shower and shave with water properly heated, with steam and everything. It's very important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, you should know, says Salty Steve, you should know that at our swimming pool... The changing rooms and showers are now all unisex, but they have no sinks. Okay, so, which sounds okay. Okay. slightly, I was slightly struck by that line, but anyway. So, changing rooms and showers are all unisex, but they have no sinks. The sinks can be found in the gender-defined toilets. You, anyway, okay. that's the setup. Yeah. So, after a long, lathery shower, I was heading to the men's toilet for a shave. A young mother and child were by a half-open door, and the mother is threatening, It's your last chance to come out! to someone inside the cubicle, presumably her other child. Uh -huh. When she realised that I was intending to enter, she told the young boy with her to go in and get his brother. The lad pushed through the door, and I saw a cubicle door slam shut, accompanied by the childish taunt of, You can't get me! Ha ha! Na na! Or something similar. The two brothers were having a right set too. I went around the corner and started preparing for a luxuriously hot shave and heard the elder brother trying and failing to persuade the youngster to come out. And they had to go home. Tea would be ruined, he said, and he'll have to go straight to bed. But his brother was not budging. The elder brother and mother then left. And the youngster, presumably blissfully unaware of my presence, started up a monologue out loud, <laughs> talking to himself. <laughs> Now, I didn't really bother to keep up with what he was saying, except to note that he seemed to be rather a whiny brat. Anyway, he was complaining out loud to the Almighty about everything and everybody. It wasn't exactly a prayer, more of a list of demands and a catalogue of things that were wrong in his life. However, halfway through my shave, my ears did prick up. As he said, God, I hope that you can, something or other, followed by, although what's really funny is that I don't really believe in you anyway. Oh. oh. Well, Father Simon, I don't know what came over me, but in my best... Oh, no. <laughs> Ian Paisley... <laughs> voice. Oh, oh, yes! And at realistic <laughs> Ian Paisley volume, I called... And for that, <laughs> you will undoubtedly now undoubtedly. burn in hellfire and damnation. So you will. <laughs> <laughs> and I apologise to everyone in Northern Ireland for that, but it was a close... I was rehearsing and everything. <coughs> Due to the cubicles and general architecture, my voice resonated rather hauntingly with an echo. As my voice died away, there was a short, stunned silence, <laughs> followed by the click of the cubicle lock. He couldn't see me because I was around the corner at the sink. I then heard a very strange noise, which was a bit of a cross between a groan and a howl, followed by a rapid patter of little bare feet making haste out of the room. Father Simon, frightening children is not my stock in trade, nor is pretending to be God or to come from Belfast. <laughs> However, I humbly beg forgiveness for this shameful lapse in my behaviour. Uh, kind, res kind regards, <laughs> uh, Salty Steve. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. <laughs> Um, I don't know if I got away with that or not. Probably not, but anyway. Uh, uh, 
Producer and sister Katie Susie, what do you say? I mean, the poor boy would have been terrified. I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't go back to that swimming pool. Uh, there was just no need to do it, I think is my problem with this. There was just no need, absolutely no cause. You could have just left him doing his monologue, ranting away, and he would have been fine. So I'm sorry, Salty Steve, that you are not forgiven. Yeah, was he just sensed his moment had come? <laughs> he hadn't done his Ian Paisley for a while, but he took he took his opportunity I mean, with had both an audience. hands. Yes, exactly. Now, brother Matthew. Well, I, I think the little boy knew what was going on. Um, I, you've got to applaud the the, the choice. I'm going to go for the Ian Paisley voice <laughs> to represent God. I I'm going to forget. Obviously, going to forgive just because it gave the opportunity to have Simon doing that accent. That is a highlight. Definitely. Definitely. I'm not. I'm not intending to add that to my <laughs> roster. <laughs> really? No. no. Oh dear. Uh, yeah, definitely forgiven. I must go and watch uh, Belfast again. <laughs> just, oh my just, goodness just, me! Because there's a fantastic preacher in that who does exactly yeah. the voice that I was trying to trying to come to. Anyway, uh, it's the people's verdict that matters, of course. Do you forgive, Salty Steve? On the text, please six one zero five four. Start your message with Simon. If you want to email, confessions at greatest greatesthitsradio.co.uk for your story but on this Simon at greatesthitsradio.co.uk forgiven or not also the people's verdict on tonight's confession which came from Salty Steve about how he pretended to be God in the voice of Ian Paisley <laughs> in a swimming uh, pool changing room and scared a small child. Anyway, the verdict is in. Yes, Kiki from Wolverhampton says, absolutely forgiven. An opportunity to scare children cannot be passed up, surely. Simon must add that voice to his best of collection, most definitely. Uh, Laura in Newtown, Newtown Abbey in Northern Ireland says, forgiven. I've just split my size listening to this absolute stonker of a confession. Your accent was superb. Oh. You too are forgiven, as it was a valiant attempt, and I can't see for tears of laughing. Uh, but Matt in Stockport says, definitely forgiven. But just remind me again how Billy Connolly fitted into this story. Now, someone else has said it was a Scottish accent. I really, really don't think it was. Mm. It might have been a poor one. <laughs> Although we got a, a vote of approval from yes. Northern Ireland. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I think you get some forgiveness there, uh, Salty Steve. If you have a confession, we'd love, to, uh, we'd love to see it. And if we like it and read it out, you get a smart speaker. You send it to confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. 14 to 6. Confession time. Uh, we would love to have your confession and swap it for a smart speaker if we use it. That's the way it works. Confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. Let's get the, uh, we'll get the music playing. Here it is. Nice fade there. I thought so. So, uh, we're still going. <laughs> so, into uh, our confession with Brother Matthew and a welcome return uh, from the pub, uh, from the wise words of producer Susie. Hello. Hello. Good wow. Afternoon. All right. <laughs> very good. What's the drink of the day, by the way? I've forgotten. Um, I, well, I'm probably going to have a gin and tonic later, I think. Okay, right. that's the drink of the day, then. That's yeah. what it's going to have to be. So here we go. It's today's confession, which comes from John. Uh, John says, My tale, Father Simon and the team, took place many years ago in a small market town in the heart of Bedfordshire. It concerned a young man of around 20 who bore an uncanny resemblance to me. <laughs> so okay. we're going to call him John. Yeah. At the time of this narrative, John was desperately trying to ingratiate himself in the eyes of a young lady who lived only a couple of streets away from his home and with whom he was desperate to establish a more intimate relationship. I think we'd better refer to her as Janet. Coolly chatting to Janet after he had accidentally bumped into her one day, she told him that she would be babysitting the three young children of her next door neighbour that evening and that John would be more than welcome to go round and help her in this onerous task. He more than happily accepted the invitation and promised to be round at about eight o'clock that evening. Well, he duly arrived, all clean and shiny. Once the children were in bed and asleep, they spent an enjoyable few hours uh, discussing the merits of various <laughs> gluten-free oh, breakfast cereals, wow. exchanging views on the possible outcome of the forthcoming <laughs> uh, general election, yeah. that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh -huh. But then all yeah. too soon it became time for John to make his reluctant departure. So he and Janet made their fond farewells at the kitchen door and he boarded his trusty bicycle to wend his happy way home. Except that he didn't, as the bicycle in question was nowhere to be seen. It had been stolen, certainly wasn't propped up against the wall next to the door where he had left it only a matter of hours earlier. Well, what to do? Much discussion ensued until it was agreed between them that the sensible adult solution was to contact the local constabulary and report the theft. 
And so the duty night shift police officer was duly telephoned. Surprisingly, he turned out to be rather concerned and very attentive, and he took down a detailed description of both the missing bicycle and of John. He promised that the incident would be fully documented and exhaustively investigated, and that John would be contacted in due course with the, res the results of that investigation and hopefully the return of his treasured bicycle. Feeling rather deflated that such a pleasant evening had been ruined by the loss of this precious possession, John made his dejected way home on foot, pausing only to kick the occasional lamppost. Eventually, he turned into his own gateway, avoided the bicycle that was leaning there, and let himself into his parents' house. And then it occurred to him. In fact, it hit him like a sledgehammer. He had just negotiated past his own bike. Oh, what? Just where he had <laughs> left it before oh. deciding to walk to his evening mm. rendezvous with Janet, thus ensuring he didn't arrive out of breath, disheveled and sweaty. Because <laughs> Janet didn't like that okay, kind of thing. No, no. That, could, that could come later. No. He <laughs> me no. Please. I just, <laughs> that's just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he, he immediately telephoned. He immediately telephoned the Kinsabri and explained to the now irate duty constable exactly what had happened. Yeah. My how, they my how they both laughed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the policeman was sorted. As for Janet, well, John had to come up with something a whole lot better. So John told her that apparently a gang of hardened thieves were working the area. <sighs> they knew a good bike when they saw one, so they were the bad guys. They were called the Chopper Gang. And uh, they were named after uh, Bob Chopper Harris and his brothers Sid and Stan. <laughs> right. Well, Janet turned out to be proper scared, so obviously John had to console her extensively. <laughs> John would have got away with it if Janet hadn't spoken to the police herself, such was her fear of the Chopper gang. PC Copper told Janet, I'm afraid your boyfriend is a lying toe rag. <laughs> yes! <laughs> yeah. So as a result, Janet refused to have anything more to do with him, labelling him as a brainless and totally unworthy kind of person, and any chance of rekindling their short-lived relationship was absolutely out of the window, much to John's heartfelt regret. Father Simon, is there the slightest possibility of the triumvirate offering a few kind and apologetic words to Janet on behalf of the rejected and dejected John, while at the same time forgiving him for being such an unthinking and careless idiot? After all, he was probably distracted by the thought of the possible exciting evening ahead of him. This is probably true. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. As a surprising P.S. Sometime after this unfortunate incident, John stepped into Janet's life again, and three years later, they were married. Oh, lovely. <laughs> they went on to produce yes. two children, and they have a number of grandchildren as well. So all's well that ends well. But in the meantime, that, to the matter in hand, uh, wasting police time and all that kind of thing, uh, and misleading Janet. What do you say, uh, voice of authority, producer Susie? Well, I do like happy ending, and, and the ending got me. That is really lovely. However, there's a few things wrong with this. Who leaves a bike against a wall? Even if you had taken it there, get yourself a bike lock. Um, you did just waste everybody's time, so I'm sorry. I'm not forgiving you, John. <laughs> harsh words from the they pub. Were. Very uh, harsh. Brother I from don't... another gutter. I mean, I, well, it was back in the 70s, wasn't it? We were all leaving our bikes out in the 70s. I imagine. Uh, so I, I get the feeling that Janet probably knew. She knew exactly what was going on. <laughs> knew what John, well, you know what John's like uh, with his bike and, and the chopper gang. Yes. Um, so I am going to forgive. But it's the people's verdict. That's what we need. That's what we need. And that comes to, down to you. 61054. Start your message with son. People's verdict on tonight's confession, which came from John, uh, and he lost his bike. Um, he reported it stolen and actually just left it at home. Then he invented the chopper gang. He did. Uh, and his girlfriend said, on your bike, as it were. But then they got married. So it, so okay. it all ended up okay, but the people's verdict is in. So Brian says, not forgiven. Janet clearly didn't like the sound of this chopper gang. Uh, John says, forgive. The uh, foundation of every great relationship is an embarrassing story. Is and it? Is it? Is it, though? Is, is, is it? I so. <laughs> and finally, Steve from Norwich says, I forgive. Go, chopper, go. Yes, I imagine that Bob Chopper Harris was based on Ron Chopper Harris. Correct, yes. Formerly of Chelsea. Yes, yes. Anyway, um... If that has spurred a thought in your mind, maybe you have a confession you would be prepared to share. If that is the case, you send it to confessions at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. If we use it, you get a smart.